everyone. Okay, yes. Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Hallie Pope. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a lawyer and cartoonist um, and the founder of a nonprofit called the Graphic Advocacy Project, which is why I am here today, maybe, uh, moderating this panel on graphic advocacy. Uh, unfortunately, Box Brown was unable to come to XP SPX, but we have four incredible cartoonists and graphic advocates with us today. Um, so the format of this is just going to be conversation between us. Hopefully we'll have time to open it up to you all for questions. Sorry, I'm going to try and remember to lean towards the mic, but if you can't hear anyone at any time, just start flailing your arms wildly and hopefully we'll get the idea. Um, so to get started, uh, why don't you all introduce yourselves. Um, Usual stuff, name, where you're from, like favorite color, whatever. Um, and if you can say uh, what kinds of causes you tend to cover in your comics, that would be awesome. And bring up when to start. Oh man, I like being second. Sorry. But. <laughs> you told me that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not even. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brina Nunez. I'm coming from Oakland, California. I'm like a Bay Area brat. Um, and the type of work that I've done in the past um, has covered um, migration issues. Um, and nowadays, specifically, I use comics to talk about um, just a lot of things I internalize um, as an Afro-Central American person and the lack of... Um, visibility that we also experience as black people within our, um, within our diaspora. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Dan Knott. I um, use he, his pronouns, and I live in Vermont. And I mostly do nonfiction comics that look at how things work and try to um, just create a baseline of understanding so that we can look at um, more complicated issues. So I did a comic with the Center for Cartoon Studies called This is What Democracy Looks Like that explains how government is laid out and I'm working on a book for Random House Graphics that explains how um, like the internet works and the electric grid and water systems. Okay. Hi, I'm Archie. Um, I use they them pronouns. I do fiction and some non-fiction comics. Um, I was a co-creator between A Quick and Easy Guide to They Then Pronouns, um, which started out as a zine and is now like an actual book. Um, and then I occasionally draw comics for the NIB. Um, and my focus tends to be around um, the LGBTQ community. Uh, I'm Matt Bors, um, he, him pronouns, and I am an, a political cartoonist and I also edit and publish the NIB. So in my own work and in the NIB really, um, we could cover pretty much anything political. Uh, my own work is kind of focused on, you know, what you might call hard politics, I guess, Trump, what's happening in the news, and the NIB is a little bit broader and uses a lot of uh, memoir, nonfiction, journalism, comics, essay, comics, um, but all that sort of relate to politics or culture in some way. Thank you all so much for being here today, and I'm so excited to talk with you all. Um, so one thing that I think distinguishes advocacy comics, obviously, is that you're doing it for some kind of cause, um, which you all just talked about a little bit. But I'm curious to know uh, sort of for how long you've been making comics about your various causes. And I think you all probably have different sources of inspiration. Um, for some of you, personal impact may play more of a role. For others, other things. Uh, so I'd love to hear about sort of what got you into making comics for advocacy purposes. And to the extent that personal experience impacts it, like what are the hurdles that you had to face putting that stuff out there? And to the extent that it doesn't, um, what are some of the challenges faced with dealing with material that maybe doesn't have a personal impact on your life. So anyone can start. You can go second, Brina, if you want to, <laughs> <laughs> to make up for making you go first. Um, I can start. So I, like I said, I make mostly nonfiction comics about how things work. Um, it doesn't have a lot to do necessarily with my personal experience other than I'm very curious about it and I'm very fascinated by how much we don't know about how things work and how we can go our entire lives without 
knowing like how electricity is made or where <coughs> your tap water comes from until you find out that there's lead in it or until you find out that um, you know turning on the light switch means that you're burning coal. Um, so um, I would say that for me that fascination and that curiosity is what guides a lot of my work um, and I hope that through the process of me learning about it it is um, other people can sort of share in that sense of discovery. For me, um, I feel like I became more, uh, I want to say, like, serious about drawing comics when I was um, a part of, like, student, like, organizing groups um, at San Francisco State as an undergraduate. And um, I used to be, to be a part of Mecha, um, even though that's, like, a Chicanx, like, centered uh, organization, and I'm, I don't identify as that. But it was, like, the one space that... Um, was very anti, like, I don't know, like, it was a very queer and, like, awesome and trans space, too. Um, yeah, just, like, learning how to make zines through them and um, attending San Francisco Zine Fest um, at least, like, around 2013. Yeah, 2013, I think, was the first time I was there, and I noticed um, um, attending as an attendee I didn't see a lot of like our stories as Central Americans, and that definitely fueled me to be like um, looking inward towards um, what I experienced um, as a youth, uh, the various forms of colorism that is really prevalent in our community, and yeah, just using the personal as like um, a political, um, you know, narrative that. I, yeah, I usually just get really angry and I'm just like, man, I have no way of like, I don't know, I'm not like a fighter. I don't like, I'm not buff enough to like go to a gym or anything and just like beat this shit out of like a punching bag. So the best thing for me is just to make a comic about <laughs> what I'm internalizing. <laughs> I don't think advocacy was ever a term that I like applied to my own work or my own life necessarily for a while. Um, but um, I do draw comics that are about personal things, things that I've experienced. Um, and when I came out as genderqueer and used they them pronouns like seven years ago, um, it was getting really, really old to like have to constantly like explain it. Um, and that's kind of where the zine happened. I worked with a friend, um, and we made like a really disposable, really cheap. It was called a cheap and easy guide originally. Um, guide to the it's twenty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's eight dollars or cheaper on Amazon now. <laughs> um, but it became like a way that I could give it to people instead of having to do that explaining, explaining and like, taking that burden off myself. But it ended up, because it was also so affordable um, and non-academic and, like, really easy to kind of, like, take and give, um, that it became useful for other people as well. Um, and so that's kind of, like, where I kind of got into it, I would say. I don't necessarily consider um, my work advocacy necessarily. I'm certainly not... Um, pulling from personal experience, really, like Brina and uh, RTR. I mean, I'm, I got into political cartooning because of the uh, Iraq war, and then I never, never stopped and, you know, got further radicalized and stuff. But, you know, if I pulled from my personal experience, I mean, it, it wouldn't be all that interesting. Like, I don't, I don't really do too much besides uh, draw comics and answer email all day. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm a white guy, you know, so a straight white guy, so... Uh, but I like to publish uh, a lot of that stuff of, of people who have more uh, personal ties to issues. But like in my own work, uh, one of the things that you showed was uh, one of the few kind of non-political uh, cartoons that aren't like satire here on the on your right, which is this is half a comic of uh, the end half of a comic of um, interviewing uh, a guy who was brought here by his mother. Um, Undocumented when when he was a child and he was a beneficiary of the of the Dream Act and I did this for a, a nib issue where I wanted to uh, show how this affects people um, and this is the kind of like nonfiction work I'm interested in that I don't really get to do as much of uh, as much as I want because I'm you know running the nib and 
doing, I have deadlines for weekly political cartoons, but this is the work that really kind of, kind of excites me and why I wanted to make the nib. And, but I really kind of actually seek to do stuff like this that I would consider more, more journalistic and not like ex explicitly explaining um, an issue and just letting you kind of come to your own uh, conclusion about it, which isn't to say that it's ob objective in any way. I mean, I'm not trying to do like a news article written by the AP. I mean, the, the, my position on, on this, reading this comic is clear and filled with my opinions, but I, I think that I'm, I'm not trying to do kind of uh, it, it advocacy comics and like explain it in an explanatory way, if that makes sense. I think it's really funny that um, Archie, you just said you didn't really think about your work necessarily as advocacy and then sort of tied that to the fact that it was from your personal experience. And then Matt, you did the exact opposite. You said you didn't really think about your work as advocacy because it's not from your personal experience. Yeah. But to me, whether or not something is advocacy sort of depends on the outcomes that you're shooting for, that you are trying to affect some sort of change, some sort of social justice. Um, and to me, reading all of your work, like I see that there. So I'm actually really curious to what extent you all sort of think about outcomes in your work, what you're trying to inspire people to do, whether it's some sort of action or some sort of like personal reframing of an issue, um, and how much you think about your audience when you're creating, as opposed to your actual sources and your inspiration. I think, um and I think one of the things that is in A Guide to They, Them Pronouns and is also in my fiction book, my fiction comics, is like empathy and nuance and like meeting halfway. Um, and it comes out in a really playful way. And like my, I have a fiction comic called Grease Bats, but it comes out in a really like playful way that kind of explores the nuances um, within the LGBTQ community. Um, and then it also is in the they them book where it's a little bit of like patience, a little bit of understanding, and like um, kind of like making those first steps to kind of get somewhere with another person. Yeah. <laughs> can you can you repeat what you what you asked. Yeah, I'm curious about the extent to which you think about sort of the goal of your comics, if right. there is a goal, <clears throat> and right. the well, audience. So, I mean, I, I do kind of not consider my comics advocacy, even though I know that they are in part. I mean, and another question I sometimes get asked on like political cartooning uh, panels or something is like, it, do you consider this activism? You know, and I don't, I don't really, I mean, you could say that it is a form of it in some way, but um, you know, journalists aren't necessarily activists. I mean, they're performing an important service, but I think re you know, real activism is organizing and stuff like that. So I don't just think that drawing political cartoons is a form of activism, but it's a form of something. I'm certainly advocating for issues, uh, but I don't necessarily find it, at least in my own work, um, you know, I'm trying to like couch things in satire and I don't, it, in my political cartoons, I don't really do comics about like what I'm what I'm for. It's more about what I'm against, um, which I think makes a better political cartoon in that in that genre. Uh, if you're doing something like a guide to they them pronouns, that sounds more useful and like something that people need, especially right now. But uh, talking about like day to day political issues, I think you know it's. I don't think it's a good entry point for a lot of people to just you know, say, this is why this is bad, and here's what uh, should be done about it, and, you know, that stuff can kind of get boring, so, you know, I'm trying to, like, address things in a funny way, or get to an issue underlying whatever it is that I'm drawing a cartoon about, systemic racism, or war, or feminism, or whatever. Yeah, I feel like um, I really vibe with, like, Archie's, like, approach to, um, the result that you want to get with your comics is creating nuanced um, characters and people that are just um, authentically themselves without, I mean, you're, um, for me, I feel like I'm sort of combating like um, stereotypes that I see being inflicted and imposed on um, Central Americans and being half Salvadoran, I wasn't always proud to um, claim that for a long time when I was young because, um, we're just very inundated with like um, 
lots of depictions of violence, um, being associated with gangs and um, being a very volatile people. And I'm just like so squishy and like soft inside and <laughs> I cry a lot. And I feel like um, just because uh, we come from uh, a people that haven't had the tools either to um, talk about our feelings and to talk about what it was like to go through a civil war um, in like um, the latter part of like the, the 20th century and to survive, um, I feel like they're always like in a fight or flight mode and we kind of like sort of inherited that way of um, just surviving. But I also feel really privileged as a cartoonist to use um, comics as a really like cathartic thing for myself personally. And for me, it's to, again, create like more nuanced representation of Central Americans and to, um, to sort of combat like the the narrative of like being a violent people of being associated with um, with death a lot, and to like make space in comics for us to kind of start a discourse about um, about being sad too, <laughs> and what are the implications of colonization, and we don't always have enough time to just mourn over what we're experiencing as a community. say that uh, Michael usually with the comics is just to create um, sort of the baseline of understanding for people. Um, I'm really trying to reach as many people as I can. Um, I mean, I don't think I took civics in high school, and I think it's a pretty common thing that even if you read the news every day, you're not like totally sure how things are set up. Um, like for the democracy comic that I did, I realized that there was a lot <laughs> that I just didn't even know about how the government was set up even after um, drawing political cartoons for years and reading the news every day. Um, and like in 2016, like only a quarter of the country could name the three branches of government. Um, so when you're like, <laughs> when you're operating from like, such low levels of understanding about these like basic systems, I feel like my goal um, is not even necessarily to advocate for a specific cause, but just to help create the understanding that then other advocates can build on um, and other journalists can build on so that um, people can feel empowered with that information. I think all school textbooks should be comics. Yes. <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah. Education. yeah, well, <laughs> You know that's come up. Uh, I don't know if if I want to do that, but I think that there's a, there's an increasing role for that kind of stuff, like informational comics and ad, advocacy comics. You know, there was um, uh, in Portland the city commissioner election or something. There was a um, I came home one day and there was a three page Joe Sacco comic on my door, I, like tied around my doorknob. That was he, was, he was doing this, uh, he did a three page comic about the rent crisis in Portland and um, for this woman, Chloe Udaly, who was running for uh, city council, I think it was. Um, and that was, you know, he, he does journalistic nonfiction comics, but that was straight advocacy. I mean, he was just like, I want, you know, I'm doing this, I mean, it was for her, for her campaign. I mean, I think she's like interviewed in the comic and stuff. and. Uh, it's highly unusual. I mean, I don't think you can buy it anywhere. I think you just had to, they printed up however many thousand for the campaign and went around enduring everybody. <clears throat> and I was just, I just thought that that was like so interesting and most people probably didn't realize as much or care as much as I did about it being by Joe Sacco. But I was like, wow, this is like really unusual. And also like, you know, it gets you to pay attention to it and read it. I mean, how many, like the, that campaign shit that shows up at your door, I mean, you just throw it away even if you're in favor of the person. It's like comics are actually a way to, you know, get people to read stuff. So I feel like there's there's a, there's a, a, a huge space in um, in advocacy, whether it's like working for nonprofits or um, people running locally or, or bigger national uh, outlets that you know nonfiction cartoonists I think should pursue and and, and also that's you can actually get paid to do that stuff pretty well, depending. Yeah, that's a really interesting point about um, kind of distribution and like, Archie, you were talking about how your cheap 
comic was cheap or free initially and still is cheap um, as a way to sort of get a broader audience. Um, and I know the Nib operates with like a, a crowdfunding or like Patreon model. Yeah, so just you like members slash subscribers, depending on how you want to frame it. But yeah, just entirely reader funded right now. Yeah. So how about Dan Brina? Like, how do you think about distribution in your comics? Like, what methods do you use to get to your target audiences? And, and Archie and Matt, you can weigh in too. Just, you did touch <laughs> on it a little bit already. Yeah, I think for me, it was always just like seeing how people made zines. Um, it's really, like in terms of production, it's like super cheap. And um, I always like want to make sure whoever's like, um, attending like a free event, like make sure like the book is like also accessible for them. Um, and I feel like Instagram has been kind of awesome too, um, to make things that are um, very quick to read. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I didn't even know that that was like another way to distribute comics too, like sliding like Instagram comics. Yeah, um, I'm a really bad millennial sometimes. <laughs> I was you, like, you can pinch and zoom on Instagram. That's the problem. Yeah, it's that's... like <laughs> I realize it's not as cool as Twitter in that sense. Yeah. I just recently got one, maybe like last year. <laughs> but like, um, yeah, mostly like using um, the internet too as another way to make content more accessible. Um, what I like about the print format and making the zines too is that you print a number of them up and they get handed around, or um, you can read it and then you can hand it to. And they, maybe someone else finds it. Um, and I really like the nature of it in that way. Um, for the Democracy comic, we raised money to give it out for free, which was really cool, um, and found that there were a lot of organizations that were willing to support us for the printing costs, um, civics organizations, because they just said, oh, this is a great way to condense this information um, for all ages. So um, while we were working on it, we were able to raise enough money to do that. And we also um, launch the Kickstarter to help fund workshops and things. Um, and on the other side of things, like for the book that I'm working on, which is the opposite, it's with a very big publisher. Um, but my goal and why I think sometimes going with big publishers for this work is important is because it's more likely to be able to get into libraries um, where it will then be free um, for people as well. I want to ask you a question. Yes. Are, well, are you um, are you still with the ACLU? No, so I run my own you, thingamajig. Now. You do this full time. That's cool. Yes. Yeah. Okay, but uh, for those who don't know, you used to work for the ACLU, and I know that you did some comics for them that you would probably describe as advocacy comics. Could you like how um, and that was I, I'm pretty sure you weren't hired as a cartoonist. I was uh, on staff. You like pitched it to them. Yeah. So I'm just curious about how like you pitched them on hey. You should let me do comments for you and how it was received and if you feel it was successful. Yeah. Um, well, I was inspired by this cartoonist, this person who did cartoons for the ACLU named Matt Boards. I don't know if you have heard of but So I was actually, before I went to law school, I was a, a paralegal with the ACLU and you were doing cartoons for the ACLU. And that was the first time I saw that. And I was like, oh man, awesome. Because I always loved drawing. But then I went to law school. Um, what happened was I started drawing for self-help materials for people navigating the court systems and cartoons are a really, really great way to convey complex legal information. Um, so when I went to the ACLU, I was sort of like, hey, I can use this to sort of talk about the narratives of the people that you all are working with, your clients, because they do impact litigation. So it's like there are real people behind the cases, but people usually hear about the issues. And so it can be a really great way to humanize the stakes of interacting with the law and they got it immediately honestly i i really thought i, I was like gonna fail they were just they were on top of it um and so i think um lawyers are starved for creative communication tools so that made it easier for me uh That's, coming from that background. well they were lucky to have a cartoonist on staff <laughs> i think a lot of non i like a lot, a lot of nonprofits and stuff i think could you know, benefit from producing this kind of stuff, like I was saying. Um. <laughs> Absolutely agree, yeah. Um, so I've heard a couple things about um, sort of creating characters that produce empathy and provide representation. I've heard some stuff about using humor. Um, and one thing that I have encountered sometimes is sort of like 
surprised that humor and narrative can play such a central role in things that in like informational comics, but also in comics that like have some sort of cause behind them. Um, so I'm just curious to know how you all sort of, if you're creating a, car a, a character that's meant to sort of be representational or promote empathy, like how you go about doing that, if you're using humor, um, how you sort of balance that with whatever topic you're uh, tackling. Uh, yeah, talk about it. <laughs> I mean, I want to make playful, fun work because it's entertaining for me to make. Um, and I think that the inspiration that is behind it is like the people in my life, my community, um, and like how we kind of discuss and come, thing, and come together um, because in like a person-to-person -person context, I find that those conversations are rarely without humor and without kind of like a, a like a joke to ease the tension or something that like just like kind of like naturally happens so it feels pretty natural to kind of include in my comics um, that's my experience with it. yeah <laughs> um i think for me it's like using moments of awkwardness when it comes to <laughs> yeah, my <but> identity <laughs> um i made this one like a uh, comic strip called uh, how to um, how to not approach a salvi femme and <laughs> it was just like um, like a dude like ask me where my people are from and I'm like oh yeah like da 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 like Guatemala and Salvador and I'm like oh yeah you must like cook like pupusas all the time baby and I'm like um, <laughs> I am the worst chef in the world. I can cook top ramen. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Um, for me, I have a bit of a challenge uh, with this because infrastructure is very rarely funny. Um, <laughs> so, I mean... Or is it always? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Depending on how into it you are, but um, I mean, every once in a while, there's like a moment or an opportunity to be funny. But um, yeah, it's a real challenge to, to find a way to craft narratives without um, with a topic that doesn't have that. And what I really, I guess, try to do to make up for that is try to have as much fun with the drawing as I can. Um, I think that when you're enjoying the drawing, that like comes through and it's enjoyable to look at. And um, having really imaginative drawing um, is also really engaging. Um, and in terms of narrative, I think um, I approach narrative just by talking about the history of like how these systems were built. And I found that to be really useful um, because almost all of the systems that we use on a day-to-day -day basis that we don't think about have a colonial history. Um, and understanding the inequalities associated with them now require like understanding how they came to be. Um, so most of the narrative that I do um, focuses around how that history has progressed. Do you say anything about humor and narrative? Uh, I use it quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I try to make up, well, I don't really make up characters, but um, I don't have anything to say about That's that. Totally fine. That's totally This is a conversation. Um, so uh, I'm curious. Uh, I want to know from you all sort of whether and to what extent you understand the impact of your comics to be happening in the world. Like, are there instances where you've had people come up to you and say sort of like, this really like hit me in a particular way or like wow I understand the internet now or like I feel like I've been represented like I'd love to hear if there are like positive stories about outcome but also if there are you know negative ones because obviously this is these are often tough subjects and I imagine not everyone takes them uh, super well <laughs> yeah uh, there was this um, comic strip um, called uh, From There to Here, and it was just like a four panel comic um, poem thingamajiggy that has like a volcano and, oh yeah, it's like in the, uh, down. 
Um, it was on there. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Buffering, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, in the middle comic. Um, I made that as like a response to um, how Salvadorans were being affected by a um, uh, dude wanting to um, remove the TPS, um, temporary protection status from Salvadorans. And it's affecting a lot of people um, who are like refugees from like Libya, Syria, um, and lots of Central American countries too. Um, and I want to get it. I wanted to get away from like using like a flag or like nationalism to um, bring us together. And what better way to bring us together than like a volcano? <laughs> <laughs> but what was really like I don't know. Just it really touched me when other people from colonized um, countries, um, um, mostly friends from like the Filipino community, were like, I resonate with this imagery um this is like yeah a part of like you know the volcano too is something that is a part of like our our stories and our identity and um people in um who identify as hawaiian too were telling me like this is hitting home in so many ways and i never expected to kind of um uh, for like this uh, icon to just touch a lot of people outside my community. So it was a really like um, wonderful thing to experience. Yeah. And, uh, um, I think as cartoonists, sometimes we don't always know what the reaction is going to be when we're making work. And it's like one of the most terrifying parts of it is that it's a lot of time mm -hmm. um, making comics by yourself and um, then releasing it out into the world. Um, <laughs> I try to at least like show the comics to people beforehand to make sure that people are getting it and that it, what I'm trying to say is clear. Um, but it's a lot of responsibility um, to um, get it right and um, to be respectful of everyone um, and just do a topic justice. Uh, I get really excited when the, like someone reads a comic and they're like, wow, I never thought about how that worked. And then like for the rest of their lives, they know how that works. These like things that surround them every day. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I can say. Yeah, this is where the internet comes in again with like how <laughs> awesome it is and what a great tool it is to like actually connect um, creators with the audience that is connecting with their work. Um, I've gotten messages about the data and book about how it's been like left at their office and been useful in that way, or like they left it on their parents' table and like they don't have it yet, you know, they haven't fully grasped it, but they had a conversation. So, um, or people who have read it and been like, I'm not binary now, or <laughs> just something which is not the dead outcome. <laughs> 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 yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, and that was the, that's been sweet. And then as far as like characters go, it's similar things with Grease Bats, which was published on Auto Straddle, which is like a queer feminist website um, for like five years. And so there were there would be comments just like immediately that were like, I, this is me, or like, I, I feel this way. Um, and I think if you like a cartoonist work, you should let them know because it does a lot, you know? I took that quiz on Autostraddle of which Grease Bats character I was, and I was evenly all of them. What? <laughs> so I don't know what that says about me as a person. I don't know. A conversation for another day. <laughs> Matt, how about you? Uh, feedback online? Or just um, reactions to your work, Pos yeah. like positive, negative, whatever. Yeah, well, there's lots of reactions uh, <laughs> on the internet. Um, you know, when I publish my own work every week and then uh, everything on the nib, I'm, you know, which I'm responsible for whether I did it myself or not. Uh, there's a lot of feedback to process. I mean, like Dan said, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, we're dealing with a lot of complex issues and, you know, there's a responsibility to get it right, which we mostly do. And sometimes people have criticized us for not. Uh, but as you know, you asked if 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 you hear if you like change people's minds or have an effect. You know, I don't know. It's hard to say like what the cumulative effect of all of our comics are because a single comics doesn't usually change someone's mind on an issue. But I mean, they do, and I think that 
you know, over the course of publishing thousands of comics on the nib, I'd like to think that there was there's some cumulative effect uh, on it. I always think about my own political cartoons. Like, uh, I really strive to do like substantive uh, political cartoons. I mean, even if it's just if it, even if I'm being very funny. I mean, I I, I don't want to like a lot of traditional cartoons I've been critical of because they're just sort of you know it's like a ship sinking labeled debt and and that type of thing, which is like really silly and just but it also just seems like a, a waste of space. You know, like I have a a space. Actually, sometimes I have physical space in papers. I used to have more, but in like the Portland Mercury still runs me every two weeks now. Uh, and you know, I have a little square and I can basically do whatever I want and they'll run it and I, d I want it to be about something and, and I, don't, I don't want it to be about a ship sinking saying debt. So, um, you know, that's just, I, that's not changing the world but it's just my little real estate there that I'm doing something hopefully important with. So I think doing comics like this, advocacy comics or political cartoons or just whatever you want to call them. I mean, there's this, there are these interesting stresses of like putting something out there, trying to get it right, be respectful, putting out your own personal narratives. Um, but also, Brina, you mentioned this feeling of like, it's therapeutic. Like you sort of feel it, like you need to do it because otherwise you're going to punch someone. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering what kinds of burnout you all encounter in addressing these causes sort of over and over and over again, because you all have been doing this for some time. Um, and whether you sort of have strategies to stay engaged with your issues, or if it feels more like you have to stay engaged with these issues or something in between. That's a big topic. Yeah. I feel like I've been online every week publishing at least one comic a week for 15 years. Uh, which gets a little exhausting. Um, you know, I kind of, I don't know, I don't really, I wouldn't say I have uh, any uh, strategies to avoid burnout, just kind of uh, exist in a state of burnout. Um, <laughs> that is not what I wanted my, to hear. <laughs> my, uh, well, currently, I, currently, my, uh, currently my issues aren't really like creative or, uh, you know, what I'm doing. It's more like business stuff and, you know, I've had to deal with all this stuff at the Nib and figuring out how to, there's just a ton of logistical and business stuff, even if I wasn't, um, you know, whatever we're calling it, transitioning from a, another company or something. Um, but yeah, being on the internet is pretty exhausting. And I've, I think I've tried to limit myself more as time goes on and I'm a parent now and I just have less time to deal with like random bullshit. So and I, I really try to focus like my work hours on work and time to be creative and write at some point during the week because I don't have time to focus too much on like going down random Twitter holes and drama, even though I still do that. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, <laughs> I find that I don't necessarily feel, I get burnt out, I think, just like on the day to day, you know, like, um, by just like not having a great balance. But if I, I try really hard to not limit myself creatively, and if I am, feeling burnt out on one type of art, I try and focus and play on a different type of art. Um, so if anyone stops by my table, I'll have like zines about like how to use sex toys, and then I'll have like a poetry zine, and then I'll have like my all ages guide <laughs> to they them pronouns, and I think it's important to maybe not, for at least for me, to make sure that I don't limit the type of work I'm doing and I can kind of be expansive and playful. Yeah, I, I have a similar approach, just oh. sort of switching between things, yeah. and you know, when I feel like I'm not, <laughs> like, if I feel more emotional and like, I'm like, I can't deal with something as like, boring as infrastructure, and like figure out how to tell a story about it, like maybe I'll do something a little bit more creative tonight, um, and something a little bit more playful, um, and then hopefully that will help inform um, the other work. Uh, <laughs> And in terms of burnout, just on subjects, I just, um, you know, I'm very sporadic on Twitter. I like go on Twitter for a little while and then I'm like, oh God, no, I'm I like it. And then I take a few weeks off and then eventually I find myself back on there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much like the same answer. Um, taking time to just work on something goofy, which would be like a awkward and self-deprecating autobiocomic strip about me just like, um, being pissed at like a fruit fly just 
flying in my face while I'm trying to read comics and just make a comic about that. Because <laughs> the other day I actually like flailed water when <laughs> it was just like all up in my face, just being aggressive. <laughs> and I, yeah, just using humor too, like just going back to doing just, um, I don't know, laughing at myself kind of helps me get through the burnout. I like this idea of kind of a, a diversity of artwork in order to avoid burnout. And I wonder if you also sort of employ a diversity of tactics in your advocacy. You know, Matt, you said before, I don't really think of drawing a cartoon as activism, um, which I don't know. I think it might be, but I agree there are so many other ways to get involved. So uh, are you all involved in other forms of advocacy or activism outside of your comics? And how does that interplay work for you all? I'm not, honestly. I mean, I give money to causes, but I don't personally go and work on them. Uh, cartooning and parenting, and that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, I tend not to be as much of um, uh, I don't organize as much, uh, but I try to, I live in a very small town in Vermont, um, 10,000 people, um, over, spread over five villages, um, which is a thing in the very northern northeast. Um, so I try to be involved in my community, at least. Um, I like, know my neighbors, I volunteer at a restorative justice center. Um, I try to do kind of just like maintenance, things like that. Um, I don't know if I necessarily count as like advocacy or um, activism, but I think it's super important to show up physically when you can. Um, and so I don't do as much like organizing in my hometown of Minneapolis right now, um, unless it's like a party. But <laughs> I do try and show up physically with my body where other people are working on stuff and to um, elevate their voices as much as I can, either by like just a physical presence of like their reading they're doing or like a meeting or if I can support monetarily, I can do that too. Oh yeah, I just want to say I go to like, I do like a protest or yes. something. I don't want I don't want everybody to think I just like do, literally sit at home and do nothing. And I'm not saying I should be like patted on the back for going to a protest. I just I don't want everybody to think I just just parents. Yeah. What is that? Do some, you know, do some stuff. Yeah, protesting whenever I can. I've also been in grad school for like the last like couple of years, so um, like. Organizing stuff was like not like um, I wasn't always available to do that. Um, but hopefully, within like the future, I become more active now that I'm done with uh, SKU um, to be more involved with the uh, with BLMP, which stands for Black Liberation uh, Migrant Project. And um, yeah, they're you're trying to build like their bases all across the country right now, and hopefully. I could do some comic stuff for them as well. Um, but yeah, I like the idea too of showing up to um, to your community and supporting them. And it, you know, I also just like to. I'm in, really inspired by my fiance to also take care of yourself too. Like, <laughs> I think that's like self advocacy work, if anything, because you never know like when you're going to be triggered by um, something that you might see or hear, and yeah. I don't know, I believe in self-preservation as being another form of, um, um, I don't know, like being very um, intentional with radical self-love. So we're gonna open up the floor for questions, but just right before we do, um, I just notice a sort of hesitance generally to sort of take credit maybe for the importance of the work you're all doing. <laughs> And I do consider your comics and cartoons all to be very important advocacy, and I do think it's making a difference and it's changing people's minds and it's raising people's awareness. I and think that too. Making them, yes, <laughs> thank you, Matt, thank you. So I just wanted to say that, and now we will take some questions from the audience. Yes. There's Oh, oh, there's microphones. So I guess line up, line up by the microphones if you are able, and we will like do that whole thing. That's very exciting. Yeah, head on over. Okay. Uh, so um, a lot of the topics you've talked about are very heated, obviously. And um, 
I know you do your research and you draw from personal experience and that kind of thing, but I'm sure, you know, backlash has happened before. How do you um, take backlash that, you know, you internalize and can use um, in your future stories versus backlash that you think is just more like, okay, well that is this person's opinion and this person's opinion is valid, but it is not, I think what I, I think my story or my comic or whatever was perfectly fine. And um, I don't, then their critique is their critique. Yeah, I, I feel like I have a lot of experience dealing with this because I've, I've been getting criticism for every single thing I publish for every day for uh, my entire adult life. <laughs> and most of it, I mean, but most, you know, a lot of it's just like, right-wing stuff or, you know, stuff you can just write off or whatever, but, you know, over time, um, I, ha I don't think I've had any, like, stepped in any huge piles of shit, but I've seen a lot of people do it and um, have learned from it and have, uh, you know, got a lot of criticism that made me feel uh, unfairly attacked or piled on, but also might have been uh, substantive and, you know, something that I incorporated into my thinking. And so, you know, where you draw the line on that is just your own thing. I mean, I think my threshold now is, is, is a lot higher for dealing with stuff. And sometimes I work with artists who have never had a big comic. I mean, we publish people for the first time sometimes at the Nib. And, you know, tens of thousands of people read it. And if, you know, if people don't like something, they'll let you hear about it. And some people freak out or, you know, and I have to talk to them and say, well, we can't take it down or we're not going to change it unless there's an error or some kind of, you know, really grievous thing that's, that was wrong, but what you do is you just like think about it more carefully the next time, um, which, which isn't, yeah, it, so it can be, it can be kind of hard to deal with, but um, I think I've kind of, you know, grown a, a real thick skin around it, but sometimes I realize when I'm publishing people that, you know, they don't, they don't have that and they haven't really been in, uh, you know, Twitter discourse or whatever for like 12 years and, and, they, and, and they really react really different to it. So I've had to have some conversations with people about how to deal with this stuff. Um, I have not actually had a lot of backlash to my stuff, um, but that doesn't mean that like a comic on the nib doesn't go yeah. slow key viral and there's like a bunch of com like comments on it that I've done. Um, you should see the Instagram comments on here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Our Instagram comments are um, nuts. But I think, I think it's always just like kind of like, um, I was trying to think of like what perspective they're coming from and um, being aware that maybe I wasn't right or I might, maybe my comic wasn't the most clear in my point of view and that's okay. Um, that they don't, it doesn't have to always be something that is going to affect everyone the same way. Um, but at the same time, I try and be conscious to not like, offend people. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I'd say that this uh, came up more when I um, started drawing cartoons because I was drawing more like political comics. And um, yeah, I think what Matt said is really true. And um, the feedback that I would get, you know, sometimes it would just be that I'd and draw a very clear cartoon, um, and that's really good feedback to get. Um, but I, yeah, I guess also, like what you said, just understanding where it's coming from. Is it like coming from a place where someone is trying to, um, you know, is it coming from a place where someone's trying to like hurt you or is hurt other people, or is it coming from like a caring place where they like want things to be more inclusive? And, um, I don't know. I think uh, it's easy to get a sense of um, where things are coming from online. Sometimes just by whether or not it's written in all caps. <laughs> um, I think the one time I just got backlashed for um, uh, like a comic was, yeah, definitely from like a right winger that it was easy for me to be like, boop, delete. Um, <laughs> but Honestly, people have been like, uh, you misspelled this word. Um, like, but you understood what I was saying, though, at least. Yeah, I don't have anything profound to say beyond that. <laughs> I hate that. I get that, too, though, because I'll publish a bunch of stuff, and then somebody will be like, you misspelled a word, and I, I, nothing I hate more. I mean, I'll stop 
where, my car and <laughs> like try to fix it as soon as humanly possible. You know, I hate when you publish something with the, something. Like that. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Do you want to make your way to a microphone if possible, or shout at us? That's fine too. <coughs> cool. Can you all hear? Yes. So say I want to draw a comic with a bunch of uh, characters who are destined to become bigger and bigger assholes over the course of the series. <laughs> and I want it to be inclusive. So from different race, gender, political identity. How would I uh, how would I paint the nuances in ways in ways that aren't like that don't hurt the cause, so to speak? I don't know. <laughs> Moderator, would you repeat the question for the video, please? Sure. So the question is, if one were trying to uh, write a comic in which the characters become prog progressively bigger and bigger assholes over the course of the comic, but also to make that comic be inclusive and have a wide range of characters from different backgrounds, how would one do that? I would like to just say that anyone can be an asshole. Um, and if you're trying to... I think if you're approaching it in a way where you're like, I don't know, like, being an asshole doesn't have to necessarily do with someone's, like, uh, minority status or anything like that. So I think just like, God, people being jerks, <laughs> if that's like your goal, right? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> And on the note of everyone can be an asshole, I'm told that we do need to wrap it up. So. Right. Um, <laughs> but thank you so, so much to you four for being here. Huge thank you to the organizers and everyone who kept this running. And thanks to all of you for coming out and talking with us. Wait, can we tell what tables? Oh my gosh, yes, please tell your tables so you can go visit them and buy all their awesome stuff. Uh, L9, I believe. I'm I12. I'm A7. E11. <laughs> <laughs> may or may not be true. Thank you all so much. <laughs>